Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by Longhorn Wealth Management Group and John Donovan. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined by Bobby Burton and C.J. Vogel. And guys, <laughs> we're less than a week away from the college football playoff, but before we even get into all that stuff, we need to talk a little recruiting. A lot has happened since our last episode of Coffee and Football, and uh, Texas grabs a commitment from four-star wide receiver Aaron Butler, and then UTSA transfer Trey Moore. Bobby, I'm going to let you talk about the significance of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, look, Aaron Butler was a interesting uh, situation. He's a California wide receiver out of Southern California. He literally did not visit Texas, but chose Texas over Washington and a host of others. Had originally committed to USC and then Colorado. Uh, some people saw him as more of a defensive back, namely USC. He decided he wants to be a wide receiver all the way. Uh, a fantastic junior year with 13 touchdowns on 38 receptions. Only played in four games as a senior, uh, but have fought, had uh, six touchdowns on 28 receptions. Uh, he is a big play threat. It makes four wide receivers, high school wide receivers coming into this class. I got to be honest, CJ, I'm not surprised they took another high school wide receiver, given what we saw from Freddie DeBose uh, in the state championship game. He's going to clearly take another year before he really gets back up and going. Uh, then they also had the uh, departures of Isaiah Nayor and Casey Kane are on their way elsewhere uh, as we speak, kind of. So uh, I wasn't real surprised by the addition of another high school wide receiver. I won't be surprised if they take, take another uh, portal wide receiver as well. Yeah, I think I'm, you know, right in the same boat you are, Bobby. I mean, when you think about the people leaving, the the the, the volume and experience and production that are all departing from this wide receiver room next year, you're going to have to find the pieces and you're going to have to find the pieces quickly. And, you know, Texas with Aaron Bumter or Aaron Hampton, excuse me, leaving the class la uh, last week, it created another void in the 2024 class to go out and find a guy. And like you said, Aaron Butler hopping in the class. How crazy is it that you, you know, really just join a class two weeks, so a month out from signing day without really even having all that much communication there and still not even seeing uh, Texas, the, the campus, you know, seeing the facilities where you'll be living. It's, it's a unique situation, but it, I think in a way it, it, it's a testament to Sarkeesian's relationships out West and also, you know, kind of the groove that Texas has going on a national scale recruiting wise to say, you know, this is, you know, a place you can take a leap of faith in and still be rewarded down the line. Yeah, de it's definitely indicative of the of the momentum, no, no doubt. And let, let's talk a little bit about that momentum because, Blake, you asked me what it did to the Texas recruiting class. Uh, it put them in the top five uh, overall, but not just the top five, all the way up to number four. Uh, look at look at the by the thinnest of margins here. Uh, Texas at ninety two point seven three one, Oregon ninety two point seven two nine, and Ohio State ninety two point seven zero eight. Those three teams, just neck and neck in the on three consensus national rankings, um, it, it looks to me, guys, like, uh, you know, Texas came on strong at the end. Uh, I also love the fact that Texas is one of the very few schools that has three uh, five-star commitments in this recruiting class. Uh, all in all, it was just a tremendous, tremendous uh, effort by, by Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Trey Moore because that, that commitment happened right at 1 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, I was told on Saturday morning that it was going to be coming that afternoon. Uh, Moore uh, tweeted just right at one o'clock. Uh, then I confirmed that with his uh, agent of record. And uh, uh, Trey Moore, a Longhorn young man, also visited Alabama, had a number of other offers, including Ohio State, Ole Miss, uh, et cetera. Uh, Moore becomes the third junior, uh, junior college, third transfer portal uh, prospect for the Longhorns. All in all, that means 26 new bodies, 26 new names coming into the Longhorn program in the next year. But really, CJ, given that there's 18 mid-year enrollees in the high school class, plus three mid-year enrollees uh, in the uh, transfer portal, that's 21 new, new folks just uh, in this next, I mean, literally two weeks away from starting classes at the University of Texas. Uh, we're going to have 20, 26 new, or 20, 21 new people uh, ready to go. No, it's exciting. And I think this is exactly, 
you know, it's a coach's dream. This is exactly what you want if you're Steve Sarkeesian and his staff, getting these guys on campus early so you can kind of, you know, get them with their own hands to mold them, to bend them, to get them to where you want them to eventually be. Obviously, they'll be working with Tory Becton and his staff as well in terms of uh, strength and conditioning and getting the body right physically uh, for the college level. But the more that you can walk into the facility and see that kid that you'll be, you know, coaching for the next three or four, maybe five years and in and, and some of these instances – that's encouraging. That is building trust. That is building rapport. And I think, you know, especially for high school kids, you know, that that recruiting cycle is a lot of, you know, we want you, we want you. It's a lot of, uh, you know, pampering towards the kids. It's now th the flip switches and you're going to get a test or a, a taste of what it's like to be a college athlete. And man, it, it's again, like you said, that many additions leading into spring ball as well can only help in terms of uh, getting, you know, the system, the schemes, everything under control uh, in your in your mind and everything that goes along the lines of that. I'm very excited, and spring ball should be very competitive. Well, speaking of uh, being competitive, guys, let's talk about the team. We're switching gears from recruiting, momentarily anyway. Uh, of course, the team returned back to Austin last night, Bobby. Tell folks about what they can expect from the team going forward this week and what's happening today and all that good stuff. Yeah, most of them had check-in last night, uh, yesterday afternoon, after spending time with their, uh, uh, after spending time uh, with their families over the holidays. Uh, some of them came in yesterday afternoon. Some of them came yesterday night, uh, checked in. Uh, they have practice again today, uh, and then tomorrow, tomorrow they get on their way to New Orleans. It's travel day tomorrow, uh, so they got they're getting ready for uh, the University of Washington in the Sugar Bowl. Uh, I, I was doing some research over the over the holiday here on Washington. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a, a a fact that you guys may not know. Dylan Johnson, the running back at Washington, is a transfer from Mississippi State. Okay, uh, he and Mike Leach did not see eye to eye, and that's why he transferred out. Right. He was one of the the guys that basically said, you know, Mike Leach called me soft said, I'm not tough enough. I'm going to go prove him wrong. He went to Washington. But what's interesting to it is he's from the same hometown. He, he was born in Greenville, Mississippi, which is the same hometown, small hometown of the defensive lineman Texas is recruiting right now, Alex Foster. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, just talk about things coming around and going around. But Dylan Mitchell, uh, Dylan, uh, sorry, Dylan Johnson, uh, a guy there that, that uh, I was looking into this year, or in the uh, offseason. I also want to mention another thing that I don't think has been mentioned enough. Uh, last year, special teams uh, for Washington was pretty good. This year, they have a new field goal kicker named Grady Cross. He's 13 to 17. Their average, their punt game, though, is averaging only about 41 yards a punt right now uh, compared to Texas, which I think is 44, 45 net uh, overall. Uh, I think special teams, we haven't talked enough about it. I think special teams could be a factor for the Longhorns in both kick return and punt return. Uh, granted, uh, you know, Washington has their share of weapons on kick return as well, but uh, something to look forward to and look at uh, as part of this game going forward. No doubt. It's hard to believe that it's only six days away now. I mean, <laughs> it just seems absolutely crazy. All right, guys. Hey, CJ, before we move on, we've had a couple of questions about your hat here. They want to know where they can get that. We've had two comments of people asking. <laughs> hey, this was uh, probably the best Christmas gift I got this year. It's Brixton Supply Co. out in Cal uh, was it Corn <laughs> or yeah, Cornoto Island, you know, San Diego out in California. So nice little gift from out there. And, you know, I mean, it's looking good. I finally got some Longhorn gear back home. <laughs> there you go all right there you go yeah so folks y'all can look that up and, and find it there because yeah back to back people asked about that all right guys well let's talk let's go back to 25 recruiting for just a moment here um kj lacy has been a the quarterback commit out of alabama has been a hot topic of conversation there's been speculation obviously he's visited auburn a few times is there reason for concern i don't think there's any question there's reason for concern uh, not only that, his teammate uh, late last week, Antonio Coleman, a defensive lineman that grew up loving Alabama. I mean, absolutely loved Alabama, has switched his commitment from Alabama to Auburn. His other teammate, Ryan Williams, the wide receiver that reclassified to 2024, 
uh, guys, uh, he is uh, he is in that situation where he looks like he's probably going to flip to Auburn sooner rather than later as well. I would not be surprised if KJ Lacey follows suit. So I think Texas fans need to get ready and prepared for that. I'm not saying it's happened, but I do think it could happen. And I don't know when. I don't know how. I don't know if he's going to visit Auburn again or visit Texas again. I do know that one of the things I'm hearing that has precipitated uh, his pause at, with the University of Texas is the quarterback situation and the quarterback chronology now with Quinn Ewers coming back an additional year. By Quinn Ewers coming back an additional year, it pushes Arch Manning's uh, time at the helm back one year and then ostensibly would push back K.J. Lacey's term one more year. And that's not something they're looking for. They want to play at least by a redshirt freshman campaign. Uh, and if, Ar if Arch Manning has two years, that would be, uh, I think, one, one too many for K.J. Lacey. That's what I'm hearing right now. Uh, what does that mean that Texas could go do in the 2025 class? I've looked into it. There's some guys around the state of Texas that they're that are worth looking at, but but they've already most of them have already committed elsewhere. There are a couple of national guys, uh, including Bryce Underwood, that was thought to be going to LSU, but LSU just lost their offensive coordinator to Notre Dame. There's also a, a quarterback out of Brentwood Academy in uh, Nashville uh, named George McIntyre. His dad is a longtime NFL or a longtime head football coach elsewhere. Um, he is a guy that, that could be a possibility, but we're going to wait and see because we have to wait, obviously, to see what happens with K.J. Lacey uh, first and foremost. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, C.J., go ahead. No, I was just going to say in this 2025 class with the three commits all being out of state, there's a long way to go till next year when we're seeing <laughs> the signed papers come in uh, with the NLI. So this will be a recurring theme. You know, guys, uh, schools, programs that are near – where these prospects grew up, you know, in their back, backyard, sort of say. Texas will be battling and fending off a lot of poachers over the next year because obviously the three guys that they have in the class right now are incredibly talented. They're going to be highly coveted. Uh, it'll be, you know, Texas seeing just how well they can defend in the recruiting uh, ranks for the 2025 class with these three moving forward. Well, guys, and I think it's going to be interesting to see, of course, Texas first junior day, January the 20th. If Lacey shows up to that or not, I think that will be telling if we don't find out before then. So. I, I agree. I think that's – we need to – and you know what? I, I think that everybody needs to to understand this, Blake. Uh, that January 20th day could be absolutely enormous for Texas. I mean, uh, Texas has not ever gotten – and it, since Sark's been there, he's not ever had this unbelievable list of guys come in on a single weekend from in-state. He's had good lists, but I don't think he, there's ever been a weekend where every top prospect in the state of Texas showed up. Given the season that the Longhorns have had, given that they're now entrenched, that the staff is entrenched with all these high schools and that Texas has had success, I wouldn't be surprised if January 20th isn't the best junior day Texas has had from a attendance standpoint of elite players uh, in, I don't know, a dozen years. I really think that it could be it could be that I don't want to say monumental, but but that impactful based on what's happened in the last 12 months. All right, Bobby. Well, before we move on, I'm going to let you tell, tell folks out there about John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, appreciate our sponsor, John. Uh, John is a proud Texas Texas Life member. He and his wife and all of John's six siblings are also UT grads. You could say it runs in the blood. Uh, so it is this deep Longhorn family tradition that led John to dedicate his firm to providing total wealth management for Texas alums, employees, family, and friends. John is a certified financial planner who has spent more than 30 years providing investment, retirement, insurance, and estate planning services and solutions to his cli cli uh, clients. Uh, Longhorn Wealth is offering to extend to each and every Longhorn alum, employee, or fan a free 90-minute consultation to explore how Longhorn Wealth can help you develop and maximize your tax-free and tax-efficient financial future. So please give John Donovan and his Longhorn Wealth team a call at 972-707-4900 or visit longhornwealth.net. All right, we want to thank them for sponsoring each and every week right here on Coffee and Football. 
And guys, plenty of time to get your questions in, so please do so. We'll get to as many as we can. And we have a super chat that we need to get to. This one from Justin Yarbrough, and he says, Merry Christmas, everyone. Bobby, are some of the 24 recruits still practicing with the team for bowl prep? You could take that, CJ. No, no. And I think this was a push uh, really, you know, by the staff. And at least, you know, at, from what I've heard from talking to a few recruits, this was the last opportunity this Christmas week to be a high school kid, you know. And I think it's one of those things that you see it at other programs. I know Oklahoma has some of their, uh, you know, mid-year enrollees practicing with the team right now. I don't think that was necessarily a push by the staff. I, I think, t uh, you know, at least from prospects that I've told or been talked to in the 2024 class, they've been told, you know, come in January 14th when you move into the campus with a fresh slate, come ready to work. Let us focus right now on what we have at hand with Washington coming up this weekend. And then let's, you know, wipe the slate, start clean and get ready to roll moving into this, uh, the new semester at the, at the, the beginning of uh, January 14th. So I think no. – yeah, I would add this to CJ. I think that as we talked to Parker Livingstone on this show a couple of weeks back, he was actually planning on being part of the bowl prep, et cetera. I think Texas made those plans until they figured out they were in the college football playoff. And then they said, hey, wait a minute. Stakes are too big. We don't need new elements here. We need to stick with what we've got. Let's focus on the task at hand. And delaying an entrance, to your point, CJ, two to three weeks doesn't really do much. Um, I think that some some uh, players may or some recruits may have taken that the wrong way. But reality of it is, is Texas wanted to go ahead uh, and make sure they're focused on uh, beating Washington on January 1. Yeah. Oklahoma doesn't have to worry about that right now. They right. can go <laughs> play whatever what, the Alamo Bowl. They can go do that. Yeah, and you mentioned new elements, Bobby. I mean – I get why recruits would want to come do that, but it seems like it would be a distraction to the team. There's no doubt about it because you're inter introducing all these new faces at the most critical time of the year. I agree. I, and I think you don't want to spend any of your practice time necessarily teaching young guys how to run routes. Yeah. You need to be teaching Xavier Worthy, hey, this is what this DB does uh, when you 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 go at him this way. This is a Jaron Thompson. This is what you need to be looking at when Roma does a runs a post you know that that's those are the things that texas needs to be worried about if it were a lesser bowl and texas had half a dozen opt-outs which is legitimately like like that that would probably happened right then it's a different story then you have more time for that sort of stuff this is a little bit different because there's the stakes are are, are amped up all right, before we move on to the next question, we want to say happy birthday to Rob Enfield, longtime viewer of the show. He says, my birthday today, the big 71. Rob, happy birthday. Thanks happy birthday, Rob. Birthday. Happy birthday, Rob. That's a big one. <laughs> uh, we got another super chat, guys. This one from Blue. And he says, what do we need to do to make the Washington Athletic Director's comments from early this season to go viral? Well, I, I, I don't think – I think that, that – conference affiliation and all that other stuff it's over i mean washington's in the in the big 10 now texas is in the sec it, it's gonna it's gonna proliferate and go from there i i don't i don't think it's that i think it's michael Penix and what he said the other day that that uh, has the potential of going viral all i remember is we won he doesn't remember that he didn't have a great day etc individually that's okay i mean I, i'm not taking exception with what he said this is kind of how he said it you know it was very matter of fact etc uh he is a great player by the way i don't know if y'all have seen him enough but his game against texas last year was was uh one of his poorer games the big piece for me with him though uh in that game is when he when his team had to have it he did it as rod likes to say he has the clutch gene and I think that that's what Texas is going to have to combat against uh, this year. Uh, another stat, by the way, that I, I brought up, Washington this year scored 64 touchdowns, 64 touchdowns and gave up only 40. That's a, that's a huge Delta 24. I mean, more than, I mean, they scored, a, you know, one and a half times the number of touchdowns their opponents did. Uh, it's a good, it's a good football team. Texas is going to have its work cut out for it, but 
I expect the Longhorns to have a better run game this time than they did a year ago. I also expect a better performance from the Texas wide receivers. Xavier Worthy dropped some passes last year. Uh, it should be a, I, I think it's going to be one of those barn burners in New Orleans. I really do. Who's going to come out on top? We're going to have to wait and see. Well, let's continue to talk about that game, guys, because this next super chat from David Smith, David at, and thank you, David. He says, discuss their linebackers. I don't think they're great. Can we attack across the middle with JT Sanders, Jay Witt, and Blue? You know, sure I, would go be ahead. nice. CJ. What's that? No, no, I said it sure would be nice. And I know that Washington has, you know, a, I, I would say a schematically sound defense. You know, there's not many times this year where they're getting torched for, you know, 60, 70 yard touchdowns. And that's the sign of a good team. You know, we're in the final four. These teams are good defensively. These teams are good offensively, obviously, as we've seen uh, throughout the season. The, the four teams remaining are good football teams. Uh, will they have weak spots? Yes. We've talked about Texas's weak spot being, you know, probably the speed in the secondary uh, and how that tr kind of translates to Washington and where they might want to attack. Texas is probably looking at that middle of the field right now and thinking, you know, Jatavian Sanders, he's had some big games this year. This would be a game where, you know, it would be probably very big if he is able to step up and and really break some break off some of those, you know, you know, over routes through the middle. Uh, get loose heading into the secondary. I think it is a, an area Texas can kind of approach uh, a little bit more aggressively. There are mismatches there. And like we've seen over the last couple of weeks, especially against Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, if Jordan Whittington is a guy that, you know, you can get the ball to in third down and seven and eight. He can stretch that into a 20-yard gain right at the sticks because he is that athletic and that, you know, I guess quietly quick. You know, we don't necessarily – consider his athleticism uh, a, a big part of his strength like we did coming out of high school, but it's still there. And we've seen it, you know, in multiple weeks this season where if he's given the opportunity, he's a mismatch uh, in, in that middle of the field. I want to say this about their linebacking group. They're pretty versatile. Uh, they are more run stoppers in general, although each of them have all three of them have an interception this year. Uh, I, I would say this, um, you know, they fill – their linebackers lead the team – are three of the top four tacklers on this team. Mm -hmm. So they funnel plays to their linebackers. Don't don't make any mistake about that. Are they superhuman? No. Are one or two of them possible an NFL player? Yes. So not unlike Texas in that regard, right? Um, I do think Texas probably has a, a distinct edge there because I think they have more of a playmaker in Anthony Hill, uh, even though he's young. Uh, strangely, I mean, I don't know, we haven't talked about this that much yet, but even though we're only a week out from the game, but a cornerback leads Washington in tackling. I want, I mean, that's their nickel type guy. He leads their team in tackling, not the linebackers. Uh, so I do think it's kind of interesting. Uh, they have, they've been susceptible, uh, to the run and the pass at times, but to CJ's point, they like to play bend, but don't break. Not unlike what Pete Kwiatkowski did while he was at Washington as well. So I, I feel like there's a, an element there that we all got to be aware of that they're not some pushovers for sure. At the same time, they do, they do give up plays. They try to keep you out of the end zone and play smart. Uh, it's a very, very, you can say what you want about individual players, whether it's Braylon Trice, the, the edge rusher, or this Zach Durfee that's going to be coming off the edge. Uh, and has just gotten eligible for them. But the reality of it is, is they are a smart, high IQ defense, not littered with first round picks. There are some NFL players, but a very high IQ defense, in my opinion. All right, guys, this next question here from James Henson. And James asks, Washington hasn't faced a defensive line like Texas. Do you all think that Washington will score as much without the running game? <sighs> Man. I I've got That's some million dollar here, question. <laughs> yeah. No, Bobby, my my point to this is last year when Washington kind of sputtered through the air, like you said, Phoenix did not have a great game. This was not a, a game where Washington was the same high flying offense that we had seen. You know, there was really only that one early flea flicker deep ball that connected for them against Texas in the Alamo Bowl. Will that be a you know a point of emphasis this year? I would bet. I would bet so. But I can also probably guarantee you that Washington's third string running back will not be averaging six, 
six yards of carry, and they'll run for 160 yards on this Texas defense. This front seven is different than what we saw last year, albeit you know a lot of pieces do remain. Uh, the uh, the defensive line has upgraded very much. I mean, I mean what we've seen so far from Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy. Uh, I know they played sparingly last year, but the two of them getting you know really the bulk and the the, the high volume of snaps this year. We've seen the production. We've seen the efficiency right there. And I mean, no one this year has had any success running the football against Texas. I do not think Washington will have, uh, you know, the, the same replicated success that they had last year as well, which plays certainly into the favor of the Texas defense, making them one dimensional kind of sitting back and predicting what will come next. So no, I I'm with you. I think, you know, this Texas line should be able to uh, withstand what the Joe Moore offensive line award winners will be bringing this week or yeah, at the end of this week. Yeah, I want to I want to say this. I I would add to it, uh, CJ and Blake, that um, Texas. Uh, look, you're not going to be able to run inside on Texas. I, I just don't think. I mean, you may hit some, hit, hit a couple of creases, et cetera. They're going to try to run outside though, and they should. Um, look, uh, Baron Sorrell is good against the run. Ethan Burke has been mixed uh, at times, um, and. I feel like that's what they're going to try to do with some misdirection. Kalen DeVore does a, a tremendous job in the run game, in my opinion, just with a lot of eye candy, not unlike what Steve Sarkeesian has done uh, in the run game at times to, to kind of manufacture something. Um, I, I am, I am of the opinion that the only teams that have successfully truly run on Texas this year is Oklahoma. That's it. And he, they ran on Oklahoma because of the QB run game. I don't think Washington wants to run their quarterback at all. Like, that, that is the one player on their team they cannot lose, right? Um, he is the nation's leading passer, threw for, I think, 4,400 yards this year or something like that. I mean, that is the one guy they can't get in harm's way. Uh, they've done a tremendous job keeping him clean in the pocket for the most part. Uh I think that Texas is going to be fine against the run on the interior. I'm a little worried about it on the outside. Uh, but the big thing for me is how much pressure up the middle can Texas get with Sweat and Murphy in the passing game to put uh, put Michael Penix off his back foot a little bit in the passing game. Those are going to be huge, huge situations, in my opinion, CJ and, and Blake. How can How can Texas get and cause disruption in the pass game not so much about the run game. I think that's that's got to be a given or else Texas is going to have a long night at the office. Yep, for sure. All right, Bobby. Well, before we move on, I'm going to let you tell everybody out there about game time. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Uh, this is uh, your last chance with game time uh, before the Sugar Bowl. Uh, I want to introduce you guys to game time. The app, it's the fastest growing ticket app in the country. And for good reason, you can get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All you have to do is type it in, a sugar bowl, or type in your city, which would be New Orleans in this case. It's absolutely perfect for last-minute decisions. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. I've personally used game time myself for sporting events as big as the World Series. Uh, concerts for both myself and my family. So if you need last minute tickets, there's really no better place. Tickets are sent directly to your phone. So you never have to dig through your email, download the game time app, create an account and use code on Texas for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code on Texas for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And remember what I said about being able to see your seats before you even go in the go in the door. All right, I want to thank them for sponsoring Coffee and Football today. And uh, guys, we got some more questions, so we're just gonna jump right back into them. And this is a super chat from Pooh. And Pooh asks, how important are bowl game practices for the freshmen on this team? Who do you think has the most growth from these practices? I I'm gonna say Jelani McDonald. Um, everything I've heard from people behind the scenes is that he needs to find a way to get on the field. Now, whether that's at star, whether that's at one of the safety spots, whether that's in some sort of hybrid linebacker role, like Maurice Blackwell played, they're going to give him a role at all of it. Um, the other one is Warren Roberson. 
I continue to hear nothing but outstanding things about the true freshman from Red Oak. Uh, the, the thing I like, you know, I know Texas graduates heavy at safety with Keaton Crawford, Jaron Thompson, and Jalen Catalan leaving. Um, these younger guys, I think, have more athleticism um, and more skill playing the ball maybe than the other ones. Uh, so while I expect Texas to have uh, to suffer a little bit of a down a down tick next year at the outset, by midway through the year, I expect the Texas safety group to actually be significantly better than this year. Now that's, you know, will they be significantly better in the sixth game or the 10th game? I don't know. My point is I just feel like there's going to be more talent in that room uh, than we've seen to this point. Yeah, I like that pick. I, I like both of those picks. Like you said, there's a lot of new opportunities for defensive backs, young defensive backs in this Tex Texas secondary uh, leading into the bowl game. And on a side note, Bobby, I was I, I love getting you know extra reps, extra practices for the offensive line, whether they're ready to play next year, ready to if if they're ready to play in you know three or four years from now. Uh, you know, anytime I'm I'm able to get them extra reps in a one on one. I'm looking forward to that. So for your young guys specifically, being able to continue high level of practice and get them reps and, and you know, extra, you know, really preparation for, you know, high level games is exciting for me. I've got another one that, that's important too, and that's Sadir Mitchell. Okay. I mean, Good if one. you think about it, Sadir Mitchell always took the, the winner off basically, right? <laughs> Not saying the big bear went into hibernation, but the big bear went into hibernation, Right. And now he's going to be on a year long program. Okay. This is no different than what other big guys have seen before too. Um, and so I'm anxious to see what he looks like having to go through all of it year round. You know, what's his body going to look like in three months when we get a chance or two months, really, when we get to see a chance to see him uh, for spring, for the start of spring practice, that, that's going to be huge for Texas. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to some more Washington talk, uh, we had a question here wanting to know about Roberson and his position. And now, of course, I lost it. But they're wanting to know, have they moved him around? Oh, here we go from David Ross. What is Roberson's position? Have the, Did they move him around? My understanding is they kept him at corner, but they've looked at him at at, uh, at uh, star as well. Uh, I think they're, double, they're really training him as a corner right now. I think that they like his feistiness. Um, there a little bit, uh, if, if in all fairness. I also think they really like his ability to play the ball in the air. That's what I'm being told. Uh, so I, while I think he could look at, at safety, I think he could look at corner. I, I think he could look at star. I would be surprised if he moves immediately away from, from corner right now. All right, guys, this next question from MJF, and he says, Washington runs a slow, deliberate offense, but do they substitute a lot between plays? In other words, will we, will we be allowed to get our normal heavy rotation of defensive players on the field? Good question. That's a good question. What well, I mean, slow, deliberate. It's an easy, It's an interesting way to put it when you consider how uh, you know high explosion. You know the, the the rate that they have in big plays can come uh, with this Washington defense. I know Washington likes to move into person, uh, personnel packages that that kind of change, you know, obviously depending on the situation and down and distance. Uh, they like keeping the same guys on the field just as Texas does, but it's not going to deter them from not getting a new, you know, fresh set of bodies in a second tight end potentially. Uh, they swap running backs every now and then as well. So Texas will be able to, switch, to swap in with them. Uh, the big thing is after big plays, they like to, you know, get things going again. I think that's something that, at least towards the uh, the end of the season we saw against Oregon, you know, when they get that big play, it's it's quick to the line. Let's get set up and, and reevaluate. It's not necessarily a time of possession or a, a snap, a, a quick snap, but it's get to the line. Let's check back and see what the coaches have in, in terms of adjustments, uh, in terms of audibles, and then run the play from there with, you know, five to ten seconds on the clock. But getting to the ball, ensuring that if the opportunity is there for Texas to have 12 or 13 men on the field, the free play will be there for Washington. All right. Well, we're going to do another Washington question here, and then we'll jump over to some recruiting. Uh, but this question here from Brandon Simmons says, the art, he says, the only thing that worries me is that Michael Penix is a tad bit better than Gabriel, and he can tear us up with his legs like Gabriel did. How does Texas stop that? 
Penix has not been a, a runner. He just had, he's, Gabriel has been a runner almost his entire career. Penix has not. He's a distributor. You know, I, I, and I think he's a darn good one. Uh, yeah. the, the numbers back that up. Uh, I, I would not worry about him running the ball, maybe on, you know, third and five and he's, something breaks down, but it's not going to be a, you may get one designed quarterback run the entire game as opposed to eight that you got against Dylan Gabriel. Um, they're just, they can't put him in harm's way in the national semifinal. You, you just can't do it. Even, you know, some, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying Texas would do this, but he slides and somehow Texas delivers a blow to his head and pop, pops off the carpet and he's concussed for not just the rest of this game, but next game, Washington's toast. I, I just don't think you can do that. Um, and, and I don't think they have to. Frankly, they're going to be able to move the ball against Texas. How much? That's the quick. That's the question. Uh, you know, that, and this is Sergeant Pickles talking about how he rolls out the pass. They absolutely. Kellen DeBoer does an unbelievable job of moving the pocket for his quarterback and giving him windows. Uh, you you can't just line up and blitz him. You're going. You're going. He's going to move the pocket. He's going to change uh, release points. All of that sort of stuff. Uh, so I, I feel like you've got to do one, not just one, any one way uh, to try to get to him. But I'm not worried about him, quote unquote, running. Yeah, but I think we can both agree he is 100% a better distributor of the football than Dylan Gabriel in that regard. Yeah. And I know that there were times in the OU game where, you know, an errant pass, you know, really helped the Texas defense get off the field at times. So, uh, that give and take is something I, that will certainly be at play this weekend. But again, I think at the end of the day, if you're not allowing 130 yards of rushing to the you know opposing quarterback, you're going to like the approach in terms of allowing them to beat you through the air. That's going to be, you know, the, the trade off there. All right, guys, we've got a lot of people join us right here on Coffee and Football presented by Longhorn Wealth Management Group since we started. So I want to reset here for a minute and go back to recruiting. We'll come back to Washington here in just a second. Uh, but Bobby, what can we expect from Texas when it comes to recruiting going forward for this year's class? Yeah, so for 2024, let's just stick to 2024 because 2025, CJ and I are going to discuss a little bit of that in today's recruiting breakdown um, later today. Um, in 2024, what's left are two high school players, in my opinion. Dominic McKinley, a defensive lineman out of Lafayette, Louisiana, five-star, currently committed to AM, but also looking at, at Texas and LSU, possibly some other schools as well. Then you have Alex Foster, a defensive lineman out of St. Joe's Academy, I believe, in Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, he visited Texas the weekend before signing day. Uh, he is still committed to Baylor, but considering Texas. Neither of those guys will sign until February 7th, which is the second signing day. Okay, that's what Texas has really left out there. Could there be another guy that pokes his head out and starts being recruited, a la Aaron Butler, a week and a half before signing day? Absolutely. So don't, don't, I'm not saying unequivocally no to anybody, but those are the two known people that we are aware of that they're going after right now. Uh, would they take one or two? I think they would just take one of those guys right now to get them to 24 commitments, okay, for that class. The bigger piece of what's going on is the transfer portal. Um, Texas right now has three transfer portal uh, commitments. They, I think, they've got uh, eight or nine that they've got that are already in the portal leaving Texas. Okay, here's where where I'm hearing it, what I've heard: possible at wide receiver, possible at pot, and these are additions: possible at wide receiver, possible at tight end, possible at defensive line. OK, those are the three. Now, wide receiver is anybody's guess. I don't think the guy that they might want is in the portal even yet. It's not Evan Stewart. OK, tight end. They're absolutely waiting on JT Sanders to announce a decision. I think the, the date on that, um, uh, CJ and Blake, we need to double check this. I was trying to look for it this morning and forgot to finish up. Is the January 15th uh, time frame when they have to decide whether they're going pro or not. And then defensive line, I don't think a defensive lineman's out there yet that they're all, you know, shot up about either. 
However, so all these t- wide receiver, tight end, D-line in the portal. The one thing I would say to you is what I'm being told is that there should be another group of players enter the transfer portal after the bowl games. Yep. Okay. And if Texas can't find what they want, they are going to wait until May, the April, May, the next portal transfer window. They're not going to just go out there and take people. If you look at what they've gotten in the portal thus far, Matthew Golden is a producer. Okay. Trey Moore uh, is a, a producer. Uh, for them, uh, or for UTSA, 14 and a half sacks. Matthew Golden, uh, his numbers uh, as well. Those guys have been productive in college football, and that is what they're looking for. They're not looking for just another guy, right? They're look they're looking for productivity. There you go. And then we're going to, I know you said we're not going to talk about 25 much, but we do have a super chat relating to it. So we're going to jump over to it. And it's something that we touched on just a little bit ago. But Mike Gosnell says, apologies if this was asked already, but is there any concern about KJ Lacey potentially decommitting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just talked about this um, uh, early in the segment, Mike. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, his high school teammate, Antonio Coleman, is committed to Auburn, decommitting from Alabama after being an Alabama fan his entire life. Auburn and and Hugh Freeze are in full recruit mode right now. That's number one. Number two is Ryan Williams' father played at Auburn, even though he's committed to Alabama. They're chanting his name at at basketball games at Auburn right now. Just to give you an, 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 uh, an example of how important that recruit is in the state of Alabama. And then you have K.J. Lacey, who's committed to Texas. And I'm not trying to say he's definitely doing this or not, but he's been to Auburn several times this year. I think personally, from what I'm hearing behind the scenes, the fact that Quinn Ewers is an extra year out now and not in and coming back next year puts another year on Arch Manning's development timeline. And because of that, uh, we we're looking at a situation where KJ Lacey's timeline itself may, may not be sped up or on the timeline that he was thinking about initially at the University of Texas. And so that's impacting it. Plus, we all know that the quarterback room at Auburn is, you know, probably a complete mess based on the fact that they've had four different coaches in the last 10 years, you know. So um, I, I feel like that that is that is probably it. Um, and that's that's why I think there is cause for concern. I'm told that there's cause for concern, but nothing has been done quite yet. Uh, then we got one other super chat that uh, has to do with recruiting, but more in a general sense. And Blake asked, what is the difference between an offer and a committable offer? Do teams extend fake offers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it happens a lot, like a lot more than you would think in terms of scrolling Twitter and seeing a kid post uh, what they think is an offer. And I don't want to speak in terms of any specific schools or anything along the lines of that, but you'll certainly see, uh, you know, some kids receive offers that aren't committable. Committable are, uh, you know, you get the word from the staff that we want you in the class. You have an open line to commit right away at any point in this cycle. If the numbers permit, you will be a part of this class. We want you here. That is a committable offer. Other times, and there's a lot of politics going to, the recruiting world that, you know, a lot of people don't see on the broad scale of things, but sometimes offers from specific schools are handed out to boost a kid's, you know, perception and image in the recruiting world. It's done as a favor to the high school coach. It's done as a favor to uh, his trainer. Perhaps there are some, sometimes, you know, you'll just see an offer in the, the, you know, the repertoire or the bag of a kid just doesn't necessarily add up with his talent. And also the other offers that are on the table uh, right there. So it's all about connections. It's all about, you know, there's a lot of political uh, strings that are pulled behind the scenes in terms of kids getting offered and receiving offers. But yes, 100%, there are fake offers uh, reported. There are non-committable offers uh, received. So that's part of it. But again, it's all about, you know, a staff saying, we want you in the class regardless of, of what happens as that is your committable offer. Yeah, I, I've got to add in. I mean, you think Nick Saban really is looking at 200 guys? Right. You know, when he offers 200 guys, that that's really what happens to to Texas. This is where Texas kind. Of, 
I don't want to use a bad word, but this is where Texas has a has a real problem, particularly with Mac Brown. He had it right. If he offered somebody in state, he felt like it had to be a committable offer. Whereas Nick Saban could come in and carpet bomb the state with 50 offers <laughs> and not really worry about it and just put. And then that kid says, oh, well, how come Texas hasn't offered me yet? Um, and putting Texas behind uh, the eight ball, essentially. And I, I feel like that's where uh, Texas needs to or, or where teams from out of state will come in. I mean, they may offer 15 to 20 guys and it's not really a committable offer. Right. Um, Alabama has done that for years. Uh, Texas, Texas has done that at times out of state, but not necessarily in state. There are going to be guys where Texas isn't necessarily what I would say pushing on. Like there were three or four guys this year. Landon Cleveland is an example. Texas, the young man out of the safety out of Mansfield, Timber, he Texas did not push on him to commit. He ended up signing with Oklahoma State, right? There are, there are some like that that Steve Sarkeesian's done, but by and large, Texas in-state can't do what some of those other people can do. Texas can do that in California all they want. USC can't do that in California, but USC can do it in Texas all they want. It's it's a, it's a, it's kind of a conundrum. And, and what ends up happening is, well, how come you didn't offer my son early? Yeah. You know, and then Texas is behind the eight ball and it, it's kind of just uh, it, it, it's a it's a spiral where Texas wasn't treating my son as well as the out of state programs. Well, you know, those out of state programs didn't have anything on the line when they were, you know, wooing your son either. I will say it's gotten significantly better under this staff than the last one. Yes. Uh, and just speaking with high school coaches and, and, you know, high school recruits, you sense it too. You know, there was times Bobby uh, and Blake, whenever th those end of year cycle graphics would come out and it'd be the most offers extended and the least offers extended in Texas under Tom Herman and that last staff was always up next to Stanford for the least offers extended throughout the cycle in the country. And you're sitting back thinking, you know, how did we not land a top five, top 10 class at Texas? And it's, you know, in part because of that. So I will say that's that's been a, a good feather in the cap for this staff. Uh, the politics of recruiting. <laughs> it's there, Blake. Believe it, buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah. For sure. All right, guys, this next Super Chat, we're going to get back to some team-related stuff. And uh, it's, it's also been a hot topic of discussion. Hookham Casino wants to know, is there a chance that Sark goes after an NFL linebacker coach like he did with Chris Jackson, the wide receiver coach? I think it's possible. I mean, a lot of people believe it's going to end up being Colton Swan, the linebackers coach out of Utah. Uh, I think that there's possibility uh, of other guys that played here too. Uh, I, I'm i interested to see how soon he makes a hire. Um, I, I don't think he's going to name anybody until after Texas has finished playing. Um, now, the, the die may already be cast and everything's done behind the scenes. Uh, but as of right now, I don't see him making a decision or a call until after, not, not necessarily a call, but making a public announcement until after the season is over. Jeff Choate is currently the linebackers coach. He is the head coach at Nevada as well. But he, he doesn't want this, again, to be a uh, issue with the team, a distraction. Um, could he go to the linebacker group? I mean, Ken Norton's out there. That's a name that, that has been tied to Sark before. Uh, there are several others. I think Derek Johnson may want to get back into coach or get into coaching. There's a lot of names out there. I think if you look at what Steve Sarkeesian has done, he's created a developmental staff. Every one of his coaches are developers. So I feel like he's going to go after somebody that he knows can develop young players. The Utah linebacker coach fits that, in my opinion. Doesn't mean he's the guy. Other guys can fit that just like nobody knew who Chris Jackson was a year ago at this time when I brought his name up as the, as the potential replacement. And so recall that, you know, just because you don't know them, they're not household names, doesn't mean they're not good coaches. Yeah. Nobody knew who Jeff Choate was, yeah. you know, and now he's the head coach at Nevada. Very true. Very true. All right, we got another super check, guys. We're going to jump back over to the Washington side of things. David Smith says, can we pressure the middle with heel on a smaller center? The left guard will have his hands full with sweat 
And by the way, had coffee with Coach Shipley and Abilene. Great addition to the team. Thank you, David. Thank you for the super chat. I texted with Coach Shipley yesterday. I don't know if uh, I got to tell you this. So he makes peanut brittle for his whole whole family. That's like his gift to his family. He, like makes peanut brittle and toss, hands it out, you know, as, as all this other stuff. And I asked him if he had any more left. He goes, no, and don't ask any. I'm not making any more for another year. He's tired of making peanut brittle. Uh, it's great that you, you saw him in Abilene. Just a good guy uh, all around. We appreciate him and his uh, contributions here. Uh, look, I think that the smaller center is a potential issue. But, you know, they, they're they 13 and 0 for a reason. They have counteract counteraction to these pro problems. It's not the only big defensive tackle that that uh, that uh, they've seen all year, right? And so Washington has counter moves to anything Texas might do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be thirteen and zero. That that it just doesn't happen that way. CJ, you have any feelings on that? No, I'm with you. Um, it's again, they've won all their games for a reason. They're in the college football playoff for a reason. Uh, I do think that they will point to and, and certainly make clear where Anthony Hill is on the field at all times. Because as we've seen, especially in the Alabama game, when he's on the field and his he's tasked with rushing the quarterback, the effectiveness is there. And his his you know ability to flip the switch and you know unlock that game breaker mode is unlike that of many of the guys that uh, Washington has faced this year. Obviously they have been tested. They've beat Oregon twice, their biggest opponent twice. Uh, so, yes, that these guys scheme. Uh, these coaches are really good at what they do. So, I 100% I, am with you. There will be a counteraction and, you know, uh, surely a game plan to see just exactly how they can prevent Anthony Hill or anybody on the Texas defensive front seven to being that guy. Yeah, and that's – that's they move the pocket, right, to get away from Murphy and Sweat. It's yep. simple as that. They try to run outside instead of running inside. There, there's a lot yeah. of uh, – this. Kellen DeBoer is a good, a good offensive coach, really, really good. And so I think that we have to be, you know, cognizant of that fact. Otherwise, we're going to sit here and uh, be worried about, you know, everything. There are certain matchups that matter. I really believe that it will depend on Michael Penix and his receivers downfield. If they get big plays – Texas is going to have problems. If Texas can limit those big plays, it's going to be a barn burn. I think it could be a, I think it has a chance to be a great game. I really do. Bobby, on, on that note of the, the outside zone, uh, you know, running scheme and, and finding out where Anthony Hill is on that defense prior to the snap, I think that is a matchup that or at least somewhere Washington can target in the running game. Hill's not been perfect in the run game this year. We've seen it a couple times where he jumps a gap too quick. He overruns. And as a result, you know, a big play ensues. So that'll be something I'm, I'll am i be watching closely because Texas, I don't think has a hundred percent full confidence in him stopping the run yet. Obviously you keep him on the field because of the athlete and the instincts that he has, but in the run game specifically in the outside zone, Anthony Hill still is susceptible to being beat. And that's just part of being a very fresh, I mean, a very young linebacker. Uh, so yeah, that'll be something I'll be watching. Good call, CJ. Well, with the uh, college football playoff less than a week away, Bobby, tell folks how they can gear up to get some gear for a Texas championship run. Yeah, hey, if you didn't get enough Texas gear for for Christmas, uh, try Home Field Apparel. They've been with us since the start of the season. There are a lot of collegiate apparel brands out there, but we wanted to partner with Home Field uh, because their, de their designs are the very best out there. Some of On Texas' favorites are the 1883 Vintage logo, home of the Longhorns Ringer Tee, and the taste Texas Baseball Script Tee. Get that one if you're re getting ready for a spring uh, series here coming up in a month or so uh, for Texas baseball. Be sure to go to homefieldapparel.com, filter by Texas, and see what we're talking about. And our listeners get an exclusive deal using On Texas 23. That's the code On Texas 23. It gets you 15% off your first order. We know you're all wearing UT gear this week, so if you're in need of a refresh, we really think you should check out homefieldapparel.com. Their designs are unique, and a lot of thought goes into each and every one of them. Uh, there's really nothing else on the market quite like what Homefield is doing. You can find them at homefieldapparel.com, and again, use code ONTEXAS23 for 15% off your first order. 
Okay, guys. Well, we got lots more to talk about, mainly Washington and the Sugar Bowl questions galore. And let's start with this one from Captain Americano. He says, I think the pass rush is going to be key to this game. How do we scheme up pressure without exposing our defensive backs too much? And not the age old question. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, Texas has been able to get pressure on, you know, seemingly every quarterback that they've played this season. The issue has been creating it, or I guess increasing it to the point where the there's a negative play involved or a sack or, you know, a forced fumble or a batted pass at the line of scrimmage. Texas has been able to get pressure on the quarterback and affect just how quickly he is able to get the ball out. But the negative plays haven't been there. So really it's how quickly and how much can Texas get the quarterback, the ball here on the ground behind the line of scrimmage for me. Without blitzing, it's going to be tough because, we again, we, we have mentioned it before, Washington is the Joe Moore award winner this year. They do have a very good offensive line. There will be some tricks and schemes. Obviously, there's been a whole month of preparation that we have seen where Texas will probably come out with some looks that we haven't necessarily seen in this season this se you know so far previously. So that's going to be the age-old question. It's really you know what's going to separate Texas from having a good day and a great day. I'll, I'll give you two things. Don't be surprised to see a corner blitz from the boundary. Uh, mm -hmm. Texas has done that. They have not done that of late, by the way. Right. They, they have held that back for the last – seven or eight weeks after I think they got burned by it a couple times against OU. They've held that back. Um, and Jade Barron has been a fairly effective blitzer. He's not a great blitzer by any stretch, right? But he does a lot of run blitzing. Uh, I, I feel like that could be a guy that they use. I don't see them bringing safeties very often. I, I don't think they're going to do anything like that. I would say the one other guy that I'm interested to see what he does is how they play Mo Blackwell. I've mentioned this a couple times, whether it's Anthony Hill, David Benda, those guys, you kind of know what they bring to the table. Mo Blackwell, you know, you got to remember, he spent some time at safety. And so he can give you that in that dime look that they give. It's a big dime, and he's he's playing dime. I, I feel like that might be a, a, a situational piece to this. Uh, I, I believe Texas has to have big games from both Baron Sorrell and uh, Ethan Burke yep. on Monday. I, I really do. Those guys have to come to play. They Ethan Burke needs to beat a tackle for a sack. Has to happen. Think about the two biggest games that Texas has played and won this year, Kansas State, Alabama. Who, you know, I mean, who stood up the most on defense, you know, in that top three conversation was Ethan Burke, the forced fumble on the goal on the goal line against Kansas State, uh, one and a half, two sacks against Alabama as well. So there's there's some correlation between the Texas front seven playing very well, creating negative plays and Ethan Burke and how well he uh, performs. All right, guys, this next question from B. Brown, and I actually looked the answer up to this while y'all were talking. He said, who's had the tougher schedule between Texas and Washington? So I looked at five or four different uh, sources. TeamRankings.com has Texas at five, Washington at nine. Uh, Power Rankings Guru, Texas two, Washington eight. ESPN has Texas at seven, Washington at 13. But if you go to the ELO rankings, they have Texas at 10, Washington at 31. So pretty close in all of them, except that last one there. I think both teams are battle tested. Both teams have played uh, some tight games, but come out the winner, right? They played in, in rivalry games. Um, the Maybe the one thing, I, I guess Washington, did Washington play Oregon on the road in season? No, no they played at Utah, right? That was, they, that, that yes. was the one. Yes. yes. So the only thing I can say is Washington is not necessarily tested on the road. As well as they would, as well as you would like them to be, um, you know they're not as battle tested as Texas going into Alabama, but they've also got a fourth year quarterback starter. Um, they've got an a, they've got a, a, a fairly um, experienced team. I don't see that that I don't I don't see enough of a difference in the schedule to say hey this one really is better than the other, et cetera. It's kind of very similar, right. 
And looking at the schedule, Bobby, to your point, uh, outside of the Pac-12 championship game, they've played two ranked teams on the road, uh, Oregon State, who were one by two, and then Arizona, where they won by seven. So close games in both of those. All right, we got some more questions here. We're going to jump right into them. You mentioned Barron a minute ago. James Henson says, do y'all think that Jade Barron will be effective against the outside running game? He is such a student of film study and well-prepared for a team's tendencies. Fingers crossed. Uh, that That's what I would answer that because, uh, look, I think people have tried to take advantage of Jade late in the season because he's such a film study guy and they've run double moves on him. They've caught him out of, you know, going off tendency. I bet, you know, frankly, I think that, that Washington will probably do something similar. Uh, it would not surprise me. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, I would bet for Jade having an, having a good game here. I don't know how. I don't know in what way. Uh, but, you know, this is a guy that's on his last game at Texas. He's had a great career at Texas. The last two years have been fantastic. I think before all is said and done, I think he's going to be a factor in that game on Saturday, on Monday. Excuse me. Yep. Uh, this next question is going to be from Diego Zanelli. And he said, are we so sure that Quinn is coming back? I think two really good games, obviously Washington being the first of those two, would definitely change his mind. I mean, if you if you follow up what we've seen against Texas Tech and Oklahoma State with two tremendous opportunity or you know performances against Washington and you know, whether it be Michigan or Alabama in the national championship and leave with a ring on your finger, there's probably a good shot that Quinn does leave. Uh, you know, that's that's just leaving on top. That's part of it. You did what you wanted to do when you set out to come to Texas. Uh, but with that said, if things don't necessarily go 100% correct, or, you know, towards the path that probably Quinn and his camp want, it makes sense to come back. And Bobby, you've mentioned the 25 start threshold that quarterbacks and NFL scouts look for uh, to kind of determine and dictate whether or not a, a quarterback translates its, you know, collegiate success to the NFL. That'll be something that is at the top of the conversation whenever this, you know, really decision needs to come down to it. So it's not a foregone conclusion that it comes back. It's not a foregone conclusion that he, that he, uh, you know, departs for the NFL. These two games, or at least Washington game, will play a big part in that decision in my in my eyes. Yeah, I was told ninety percent about a month and a half ago. I got vilified for that a little bit. Oh, what do you mean? You know, I I was that that was not just one source; it was multiple sources. You know, then you know Pete Thamel says yes, he's leaning to, towards coming back. So it kind of you know the 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 issue kind of subsided. Uh, then I was told it's more like ninety five percent. OK, so he was really I, I think he was all but set to come back. What I think is entered the, into the picture now is exactly what you're talking about is what if he has two great games? Yep. Personally, I think it changes the calculus of, of his decision uh, unquestionably, because then you're going to be looking at a guy if he outshines Michael Penix and then either J.J. McCarthy or Jalen Milrow back to back. Again, yeah. Yeah, it, you, you get my point, though, right? Then if I'm his agent, and I know who his agent would likely be, you know, you, you have to relook at your, your situation because you're like, how is he ever going to be any, any hotter, right? But those are a lot of ifs. Right now, I think it's more likely that he plays well but doesn't go for 500 yards or four, 450 and – all that other stuff. I, I think it's more likely he plays well. He does. And, and, and to this point, I want to say this, I think the world of Quinn and his long-term ability, he has some physical maturing to do that yes. just doesn't happen overnight. You saw how he's remade his body. He still has to get on the squat rack, man, and get lower body going, right? Those are the things that he needs to do that you can't just do tomorrow. You can't get it done in six months. It takes years to develop that. I mean, he's still going to be growing once he gets into the NFL as it is. And so I do think it'd be good for him to come back another year, personally. Um, I think that's what's best for him. That being said, he goes out and wins national championship MVP and tosses for 450. You know, all bets are off, in my opinion. Yeah. 
to your point, he's not a guy you can tush push with, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not. <laughs> not at all. But, but yeah, no, I'm with you 100% there. All right, guys, the next question from MJF. And MJ says, Penix gets the ball out quick. So have any teams had luck asking their defensive line to stop their upfield rush, jump, and try to bat passes down? With Burke and Collins hot, is that a tactic worth trying? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's reinvent reinventing the wheel in any sense there. I mean, you know, when, when guys get the ball out quick, and Washington's really good at it. Washington necessarily isn't a team like Texas that uses a lot of behind the, uh, the line of scrimmage in their offense. I think Texas is amongst the, the nation's leader when it comes to quick screens, bubbles, uh, you know, things along that nature. Washington is more get the ball out around five to seven yards down the field and then obvi obviously extend that into the intermediate and the deep uh, passing route as well. So, yes, the opportunities will be there. I think in college specifically, you see these, you know, plays behind the line of scrimmage because, one, teams like to play eight to ten yards off the line of scrimmage at the cornerback position. And, two, it, it negates exactly what you just brought up in the sense of the defensive line not getting to the quarterback but getting hands up in the air – and with guys like Sweat uh, and, and or, you know, Sweat, Collins, Burke, you know, guys that have good size on them, that will be something that Texas talks a lot about because it's going to frustrate the defensive line. But when you're a frustrated defensive lineman, it now turns into how else can I affect the game if I'm not getting home? So that will be a topic of conversation, even a point of emphasis. And uh, it, it certainly lines up for Texas getting a hand or two on the ball. And we all know how important that is. You know, this season, dating back to Kansas State and what uh, Tavondre Sweat was able to do on that goal line stand. And while we're on the subject of Texas defensive line, uh, obviously a Washington fan here, but they've been phenomenal in the chat. Sergeant Pickle says, I actually think a big part of this game that few are mentioning is Washington press uh, pressuring Ewers. Huskies have low sack numbers, but high on pressures. They affected him enough last year to make a difference. Um, you know, I agree. Look, um, they did affect him some, but, you know, Quinn Ewers kind of had his first big game outside of Alabama against Washington. I, Washington fans, I, and I, Sergeant Pickles is a Washington fan, so I'm going to try to answer this politely. Texas really opened up the offense against Washington last year. Before then, Texas had been Bijan and Roshan specific. They they really had leaned on the Texas run game. Uh, what we saw against Washington was a quarterback that started throwing the ball around the yard pretty good. Um, and that is carried over into this year. Uh, so I do think that um, whether it's Braylon Trice or, or Zach Durfee or whoever's going to come with pressure that, you know, there's a handful of guys that have sacks for Washington this year. The, the bigger piece for me uh, as it relates to, to Quinn Ewers and, Washington getting pushed. It, look, these are both good teams. Both teams are going to have their way with the other at times. It's right. going to be, does Penix have more time than yours? Are, you know, it, it's going to be so, just small things that will add up to being the difference in this game. Me sitting here saying, I'm super worried about the, uh, Washington pass rush. That's not true. I am worried about the Washington pass rush. I'm wor I'm most worried about the Washington offense. You know, just like you're probably most worried about the Texas offense and the Texas defensive interior. If you're a Washington fan, right? The there these are two really good football teams. You know, they're in they're in this position for a reason, and so. You know, which one is going to come out on top? We're not discounting. Like, like, you can't discount the Texas secondary. Texas secondary is a quote-unquote weakness. It's not horrible. It's not It's not even close to being the worst Texas secondary in the last 10 years. Okay? So, you know, there are pieces in, in, that we can all massage around and, and say this way. I don't think that – I don't think anybody is just unbeatable. Uh, in this group. I don't think Texas is unbeatable. Do I feel like Texas can win this game? Yes, I absolutely do. But it's not so one-sided in any capacity, in my opinion. Hi, guys. You're watching Coffee and Football presented by John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group. And we got time for about one or two more questions at the most. And this first one's a super chat from J.A.R. Thank you, Jay. 
He said, could we see Texas go after Keelan Russell? Of course, the Duncanville quarterback, 2025 kid. His stock is rising and could also help with more, especially with the writing on the wall with we see currently. I mean, Keelan Russell has been as high as a, a you know a quarterback prospect in the state as of late. I will say I think Sarkeesian is a specific mold and type of quarterback that he likes to pursue. Obviously, you know, we, we know what Quinn is physically. Trey Owens kind of fits that same mold. Uh, Arch, believe it or not, is probably on the little bit looser side of things in terms of athleticism and willingness to leave the pocket in terms of running and, and you know, kind of extending plays in that regard. So it, it's all about making, you know, accurate passes. If, if Sarkeesian believes that a quarterback prospect is a guy that he can fit into his system and make every pass on the field, he'll pursue them. Right now, I'm not sure Keelan Russell is necessarily that type of player. Obviously, he's had great success on the field uh, at Duncanville. He has great players around him, obviously, with DeCorian Moore and, and Katie Dotson. So that's something to, to watch. I do think, above anything else, it'll be frame and it'll be the ability to uh, make every throw on the field. So right now, I, I put that at, on a pause, on a, you know, we'll come back and reevaluate down the road. All right, Bobby. Well, before we get out of here, let everybody know what they can expect later today right here on On Texas Football. Yeah, absolutely. I, I got the recruiting breakdown coming up next. We're going to talk about that. Then I, Rod and I are going to do a little talking ball on uh, Washington uh, today. And then we'll have the live stream tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, we also have a bunch of stuff tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, Cedric Griffin, uh, the uh, former Longhorn DB that won the national championship in 2005. Knocked out Dave Kurtman, if you remember that. Knocked the head, off, knocked his head helmet off in the uh, USC game. He'll be with us on Wednesday. Uh, we have Coach Brian Irwin later in the week as well as Bob Shipley too. So I uh, hope you guys can join us uh, throughout the week, and I hope everyone had a merry Christmas. To be, honest. I've got a new chair, by the way. My my kids gave me a new chair. They said I've been sitting the other one too much, so they gave me a new chair. That's my Christmas present. Thank y'all. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Coffee and Football. We want to thank John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group, along with Home Field Apparel and Game Time. Be sure to check all three of them out. want to thank all of you for tuning in. Thank you for the super chats. And uh, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It would mean a lot to us. And then ring the bell so you're notified anytime and every time we post a video. And for Bobby Burton and CJ Vogel, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Six days Merry away, Christmas. guys.